Okay, so welcome everyone. I hope you are fine and welcome to our Professor Gordon Kennedy. <laughs> Today is the seventh lesson of the English uh, for the Environment course microlanguage course. Uh, the main topic today will be pollution. I only remind you uh, a little thing. Um, I, will send, I will send you in the chat uh, the link uh, to be able to sign your presence. So you can check during the lesson and you will find the link. Okay? Um, so Professor Gordon, Okay, thank you. Thank you, Agnese. Thank you very um, much. Okay, hopefully, uh, hopefully everyone can can hear me okay. Um, so, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I hope uh, everyone's had a good uh, a good summer, and I think uh, we're all probably uh, getting busy again, preparing for the new year. Some of for the new school year. Uh, some of us may already have uh, started. Um, I don't know. Different countries have different uh, timetables. So, um, uh, whichever, whichever point you are, uh, best of best of luck for the uh, uh, for the coming uh, for the coming school year. Okay. So, hope for. I think you can see my screen. Um, it seems to be being shared. So. Um, uh, so I oops oh it's gone black <laughs> this is this isn't a good sign okay uh, okay right here we are okay so um, I've got the calendar up uh, here and I just wanted to um, I just wanted to show you sort of where we are because uh, last time we had um, we had an extra session which was in June, uh, and this was uh, a session where I, I introduced the En-ROADS uh, climate modeler. Now, it was sort of pushed in right at the end, um, and um, I, just want to, uh, I just want to sort of make sure that that's something which you keep, let's say, keep in your minds, because it's a very, 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 very interesting, very powerful uh, a tool for uh, communication about uh, about climate, and I think if anything, over over the last couple of months, uh, I think the uh, the whole thing about the climate, uh, what's happening, climate change, is starting to become uh, much much more present in the various discourses. Um, okay, we've had Afghanistan in the last month, but in the background uh, we have uh, the climate and um, understanding about climate change and all of the, let's say, the various facets of the environment um, uh, and how they're connected to each other is uh, I think is incredibly important and it, it is becoming ever more important because it's quite clear now that um, way, the way things have been going we're on a, uh, a path which is no longer fully sustainable. So, coming back to our coming back to our, um, our let's say excursion into environmental English um, I've inverted a couple of things and today I wanted to talk about pollution. Um, there's no particular reason other than the fact that I happen to have more of the materials uh, ready so uh, I've just done, uh, done that change but I haven't uh, modified the overall um, look of the uh, topics we're going to, to uh, we're going to co cover. Okay, so I'm going to start, and I'm going to talk about uh, talk about pollution. Of course, if you have any uh, comments or if you have any questions, please put them in. Either save them for the end. We'll have a, a, a little bit of free time at the end to discuss uh, or to ask questions, or put them in the chat. Um, if I see them in the chat. Uh, I can possibly answer as we are, let's say, uh, as we're going along. Um, so, okay. Um, so let's just see if this will actually work. Oh yes, it will. There we go. Right. So, um, so I suppose the, the basic, 
the very basic question. Uh, we need to start with definitions, and uh, the question is, what is pollution? Um, and the answer, the simple answer, is the introduction of harmful materials into the environment. Uh, harmful, what does that mean? Well, here we're quite clearly talking about um, materials or substances which have a deleterious effect on um, biological life forms. So, um, in particular, as, as humans, we sort of have a particular have our own. Obviously, we have our ideas of of what pollution is and uh, how much we actually cause, as you will see. Because, of course, one of the things uh, which is characteristic of our species is that we modify our environment considerably. Um, we're not the only species that does this, but um, we are certainly the species which does it uh, to the greatest extent. Um, and in fact, that's one of the characteristics of, of humans is that uh, we are able to, to change uh, our environment into something that <coughs> works, for, works for us. Of course, doing these changes, making these changes, um, does mean that uh, uh, it does mean that uh, certain things can, let's say, go wrong. So, harmful materials could be could be things which people produce. Uh, they could also be things which nature produces. So we have to remember that nature isn't uh, isn't necessarily benign. It just is. And um, if we look at the uh, look at this example here, we can see that the volcano uh, we have a volcano which is um, erupting. It's releasing materials. It's releasing gas. It's releasing dust. Um, and this, of course, is totally natural. It's part of the geological processes of orogenesis and um, uh, mountain building and what have you. So this is an absolutely uh, normal example, but of course gases that come from, um, come from a phenomena like, uh, like volcanoes um, can be highly toxic, as can uh, as can some of the uh, uh, some of the other things. So um, we may be talking about man-made uh, pollution. We may be talking about um, natural pollution, if you like. So looking uh, looking more sort of let's say uh, more closely at pollution itself, um, you can divide pollution into different types, of course. And some of these are perhaps much more familiar uh, than others. And I think um, part of this is because as we've, uh, as we've grown up and we hear stories of uh, oil spills and natural disasters and stuff like this, um, or disasters which affect nature, um, certain, let's say, certain um, aspects of pollution are more easy to relate to, or they come to mind more easily. Um, maybe the ones that we don't think of so often are the ones at the bottom where uh, thermal pollution, for example, you might ask, well, what is thermal, po thermal pollution? Um, light pollution, this is, again, something which is becoming much more, uh, let's say, uh, present. Um, and also uh, or, uh, acoustic or sound pollution as well. But let's say the typically the um, our attention would be drawn to the top group, which are uh, are those. Uh, it's pollution associated with air, uh, associated with water, and associated with land. Um, and then we have uh, radioactivity, which of course everyone is going to think of. Uh, uh, Chernobyl and Fukushima, um, of course, but um, 
again, this, these are these are the, let's say the big ones that we tend to think about. That's not to say that these bottom ones here are not important. And I think as we understand more, uh, these will become um, these will become more important, particularly as we uh, talk about sustainable cities and we talk about uh, how um, uh, urbanisation changes uh, changes the balance of things okay so um, but at the moment for the for today we're going to start by looking at uh, the, this this top group okay so um, I'm going to start with uh, air pollution this is a photograph of dust um, and air pollution I think is something which we all recognize um, I think this is a this is a city uh, suffering from smog um, somewhere in uh, I think I think it might be China t to be honest with you but I'm not sure anyway um, this type of pollution is typically associated with uh, the so-called mega cities uh, could you please okay um, and in the past, in the past, some cities were notorious for their um, for their polluted air. So the classic examples are um, is the other smogs from uh, from the 1950s in London. Um, and this was uh, these these smogs were so severe that. Um, people literally could not see you could not see your hand in front of your face uh, with these uh, smogs so dense and they were caused by uh, a number of uh, let's say conf a number of factors which came together um, amongst which was coal burning burning coal uh, but burning pure quality uh, sorry poor quality coal um, which of course was cheaper and most people couldn't afford uh, the more expensive stuff and this led to a whole sort of let's say a whole set of consequences which uh, which which led to the formation of the so-called pea soup pea soup fogs which uh, pea soup is um, uh, in, in Italian it's uh, zuppa di piselli okay um, and it's uh, it's particularly dense okay so it gives you the idea um, from a chemical point of view this was uh, this was deadly stuff uh, we're talking sulfuric acid basically uh, 1980s but also today uh, Los Angeles was famous for its photochemical smogs which uh, used to um, plague the city on its on particularly on particularly sunny days. Um, more recently, um, we've seen similar things in Beijing, uh, Pekin, uh, in Delhi. Uh, they have terrible, terrible trouble with um, uh, uh, polluted air. And the Po Valley, which is uh, one of the most polluted areas uh, in from. The point of view of air pollution in the whole of Europe. Um, Agnès is looking rather surprised there, but it is. <laughs> and there are reasons. There are reasons for this. Um, so let me just see if I can. Okay. So let's think about what what air pollution actually is. So it's not just outside, though. It could also be indoors. So it's basically if we think about yeah uh, Paula so do I <laughs> um, it's it's a physical or a biological or a chemical alteration to the air in the atmosphere okay which makes it contaminated in other words it has stuff in it which normally wouldn't be there um, this can be this is a valid definition whether whether we're talking indoors and outdoors because that's another thing that we tend to we tend to think that air pollution or polluted air is associated with the traffic outside um, but of course the air outside also comes inside and you can filter it and you can do what you ha do what you like but you still may have um, 
air being polluted because of things which are happening inside as well. So we're going to have a look at some of this. So what sorts of things are causing uh, this uh, this type of pollution? Well, we've got um, everything from gases, harmful gases, dust, smoke, um, and these are the sorts of things which uh, okay um, these are the sorts of things which are uh, which can affect the ability for uh, plants and animals to uh, to respire um, and of course for people and for animals mammals in particular who are you which are using <coughs> Uh, membrane-based respira respiratory systems, uh, it can become uh, it can become a source of ill health. So this is obviously um, uh, something which we really do need to we really do need to look at uh, carefully. So just a, a brief list, and I'll have a look at some of these in a little bit more detail. But don't worry. This isn't going to be a chemistry lesson, okay? Um, but some of the names may be familiar. Some of the names may be a little bit less familiar. So um, we have uh, things like sulfur dioxide. We have carbon monoxide, which is um, sometimes in the news, particularly in the winter, because this is the gas which is produced when uh, you don't burn fuel sufficiently and so you release carbon monoxide which is extremely toxic to people um, carbon dioxide well that's something that we are producing as we breathe we breathe in oxygen we release carbon dioxide as a product of cellular res respiration but it's also the principal one of the principal products of burning hydrocarbons hydrocarbons petrol benzene, okay, oil, or coal, or gas, uh, as in methane, okay, so, and of course carbon dioxide is associated with global warming, which is something that we will talk about in a different session. Then we have things like the nitrogen oxides, um, a whole set of things called volatile organic compounds, uh, some of which are um, it may sound exotic, but some of them are actually very, very, uh, uh, very, very everyday type of chemicals. And I bet that you've got them in your house, in the kitchen or in the bathroom. Um, particulate matter. And this can be uh, everything from uh, large, large particles to um, the smaller, the PM 2.5s, which are... Um, the uh, the micron range uh, particulates which cause problems with uh, with the lungs uh, ozone which you have probably heard of in terms of the ozone layer the ozone hole uh, chlorofluorocarbons CFCs for short because it's easier to say um, these are um, well, we'll meet, we'll meet these guys uh, a little bit later. And then you have things like uh, hydrocarbons, uh, petrol, uh, which is typically, um, <coughs> which, is, which are typically uh, um, burned in engines, uh, cars or trucks or whatever, but which um, may be... Uh, not burned to 100% efficiency, so you still have some uh, some partially uh, partially unburned materials, and then of course we have things like lead and other uh, heavy metals, which are sort of present in um, in different guises in the in the uh, in the environment. So, um, thinking about thinking about the smogs and going back to the example of, of London um, this looks quite like quite a nice uh, idyllic uh, countryside scene uh, we have some trees we've got a sort of it might be sunset or it might be dawn um, it looks like it's a frosty winter morning um, 
this is a classic example of a of an inversion, a temperature inversion. So uh, these clouds here, or this fog, is is trapped in a valley. Okay. Now you can imagine if you have a town in that valley, um, this air is trapped there, and what's happened is there is a the, this cold air can't escape, and what happens is as people move around and do their stuff and cars move and what have you, um, this air becomes more and more polluted. But until there is a big change in the weather, uh, this will stay quite stable. Um, this is a classic phenomenon that you find in, um, in places like London where the London, although it doesn't have high hills around it, it is in the sort of like a bowl, a large bowl. Um, it's also a classic example for the Po Valley, which is on a much bigger scale, um, but it's surrounded, uh, it's like a funnel, and it has mountains around it, reasonably high mountains. Um, what this means is that uh, with a combination of lots of people, lots of industry, lots of traffic, um, a temperature inversion, and basically the the air the air pollution uh, just goes it goes exponential basically, and um, it becomes very very high very quickly. And I can t I mean our personal experience here in northern Italy is that um, this can happen. It can go on for weeks in the winter, and. This is the sort. This is the let's say the um, the cause of uh, the blocks in the traffic where the communes or the various uh, councils decide to stop traffic moving around. But um, these are relatively ineffective uh, measures. You 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 need something uh, a lot more. Let's say uh, a lot more in, incisive to be able to. Uh, manage this type of uh, problem. Okay, so so you may have geography, uh, and many many uh, big cities are actually situated in places which have quite unfavourable geography from this point of view. Uh, so um, so looking at look, looking at the actual, let's say, the pollutants in a little bit more detail. Um, now. I've realized that my audience here uh, may be some people who have got a bit of a science background, maybe some people who haven't got so much science background. So um, what I want to try and sort of communicate here is this idea of size, okay? Because of course, in the physical world, things have different sizes. Uh, so you go from scales of mountains, elephants, uh, people, and then you go to ants, and then you go further. You get you get down to specks of dust, but you can go further. And the idea here is that the pollutants, the pollutants that will that form air pollution, um, you can roughly divide them into visible and invisible. Okay. Now, what does that mean? Well. Obviously, visible means you can see it. Uh, the idea here is that you have pieces of material which can be ever smaller, but they're still pieces of that material. At some point, you no longer have pieces of material. You have molecules. And molecules are so small that they are actually part of... It's like they're part of the, uh, they're part of the gas of the atmosphere. So they, it's like it's been dissolved in the atmosphere. The atmosphere is a, is a gas, but from a physical point of view, it can be considered as a liquid in the sense of how it behaves. And so at some point, once you, when you start talking about actual molecules of um, pollutants, they are dispersed just as if they were a nitrogen molecule or an oxygen molecule, which are perfectly normal um, parts of the of the of, of the the mixture of gases in the atmosphere okay so looking first at this idea of the visible 
So this is stuff that you can actually you could actually see. It could be very very small. You may need a, a powerful microscope, but you can still uh, picture this. Um, so a classic example is to um, put a piece of white, put out a, a white handkerchief or a piece of white material out near a road. Leave it there for a couple of days and come back and have a look at it. Um, and of course, you're going to find that it it gets uh, it gets very dirty very very quickly. Um, if you look at this with a um, a magnifying glass, or if you look at this with a um, a microscope, you will see that there are particles of different sizes. Um, what are those particles? Well, there's a whole there's a whole set of stuff, um, but particularly if you're near a road. Um, <clears throat> Have you ever thought when you drive your car why after a couple of years you have to change the tires? Well you change the tires because you no longer have tread. The, the tires are wearing down. Where does that stuff go? Well of course some of it's just uh, it, it, um, it's attrition as the car goes across the road. Attrition and friction uh, removes some of the rubber, and you leave some of the rubber on the road. But what you're what you're also doing is you are dispersing this as small pieces, and these small pieces uh, of material are extremely light, and so you don't need a lot of air you don't need a, a a lot of air current for these things to actually move around okay and so what you can have is you can have um small pieces of uh of material from the road surface from the tire surface from the car which <clears throat> float around in the air but of course the air contains gases it's a nitrogen oxygen um but it also contains water water droplets. Now, droplets obviously are made of many more, many water molecules coming together. And if the droplets are big enough, it's actually raining. Okay, uh, but the droplets may be quite small, and they can stay suspended. So what can happen is you can have um, you can have the water droplets attract these uh, these small particles uh, it's typically electrostatic and surface forces which call that cause these things to aggregate and so what you get is you get um, you get a mixture of uh, of pieces of water material which are um, which is suspended and this is an aerosol and an aerosol is uh, is so the, the the components in the aerosol are small enough that the uh, that the forces on them uh, allow them to stay suspended in uh, in the air for a long 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 time. Okay, so um, you get uh, you get this idea of um, uh, the, the, let's say the smog is not just uh, it's particulate matter it's not just particulate matter it's particulate matter attached to water uh, water droplets and it's just hanging around um, because they're bigger or slightly bigger they are subject to um, to, to air movements and so they they can become really quite uh, quite mobile and of course we will breathe these and uh, when we breathe them in um, this is something which can cause uh, this is something which can cause uh, serious uh, problems in the in the lungs okay um, so for example if we look at the example of the the uh, the PM 2.5s um, particulate matter 2.5 the 2.5 refers to microns which are um, micrometers okay so that's 10 to the minus 6 meters so it's pretty small but to give you an idea um, it's about 30 times uh, smaller than the diameter of a human hair so that's pretty small 
but of course because it's small it can get into the deep parts of the of the lung uh, tissue and it can cause really quite serious uh, really quite serious problems so this is one of the reasons why we need to be aware of um, air pollution traffic pollution as uh, as a health as a health risk okay what about the invisible well um, as I said, I, I don't know how many science people I got here, and this isn't intended as a as a chemistry lesson. So uh, I just want to uh, I just want to sort of illustrate the idea that um, if you go if you go right down to the level of the uh, of the molecules, um, then the behaviour of these things is a little bit different so the large part of that let's say the particles that we've just seen are obviously a lot bigger than uh, molecules they're, they're massively bigger um, and the damage that they tend to cause is quite mechanical okay it's a, it's a, it's as if you were rubbing something on your skin uh, it, it's um, it's a, a mechanical action Okay, and uh, so you have um, you have particles which are penetrating into the mucous membranes of the lungs, for example. The difference with the the invisible components, which are the gases, uh, is that they are they become part of the air that you breathe, um, and so their action is actually chemical it's not as it's not a, a mechanical action it's actually a chemical action so um, normal air is made up of about 78 percent nitrogen about 21 percent uh, 21 percent oxygen and there's a few other bits and pieces um, a small a very small amount of carbon dioxide um, although that's increasing but that's <laughs> that's another tale um, but when we're talking about uh, when we talk about air pollution, um, we have things like um, nitrogen reacting with the oxygen to give us things like nitrogen oxide, or we have things like sulfur reacting with the oxygen to give us sulfur dioxide, sulfur trioxide. Um, the chemistry is extremely the atmospheric chemistry and the chemistry of pollution is actually well it is pretty complicated actually it's pretty complex um, however a lot of it is very well understood and it's well known um, because it's been studied for such a long time um, but the thing is that these these molecules are produced for example sulfur dioxide is produced by volcanoes um, it's also produced in internal combustion engines um, where the fuel source, the hydrocarbon fuel source, contains a higher quantity of sulfur. Um, so thinking about, uh, thinking about the different types of um, fuel available, um, you have from normal petrol to diesel and then you have uh, grades of diesel which are increasingly let's say um, increasingly less uh, homogeneous uh, that's being nice basically they're dirtier uh, until you arrive at stuff at the stuff which is used in ships for example um, which is basically uh, extremely, uh, extremely, let's say, crude. Uh, it, it is refined, but it's the, re the refining is fairly minimal. Um, and this type of fuel uh, contains a lot of sulphur. So if you have an old, an old engine, an old car, uh, or an old truck in particular. Um, you may be using fuel which has uh, a higher content of sulfur and in the heat of the engine uh, as you're burning the hydrocarbon 
um, some of the sulfur will react with the oxygen. Um, similarly, the heat of the in the heat of the exhaust, you can have because there's so much nitrogen around, um, and there is oxygen as well. You can have uh, a reaction between nitrogen and oxygen, so that you uh, you start to create these uh, additional compounds. Carbon dioxide, as I said, is one of the principal products, together with water, of, um, of when you burn hydrocarbons. Um, now, carbon dioxide has its own effects. Uh, these guys, in particular, though, um, they are uh, they have effects because they are soluble in water. Um, CO2 is also soluble in water to an extent, and that's part of the uh, the ocean cycle. But as I say, we'll talk about that another time. Um, so, in particular, the sulfur and the nitrogen are involved in acid rain, or they are so they are associated with acid rain. Um, I think we'll have a look at that in a in a minute. Uh, the carbon dioxide is associated with um, climate change, global warming. The, you can also imagine that the nitrogen oxide and the sulfur oxide are not too pleasant to breathe in, uh, and they're also associated with, uh, of course, with the um, uh, with with health effects, res respiratory uh, effects, and some of these effects are such that the thing itself may not kill you, but it makes you more susceptible to. Uh, pneumonia, respiratory infection, um, and this type of uh, this type of thing. Okay, so this is just uh, as I say, this isn't intended as a chemistry lesson, but this is just an example of uh, what happens when um, uh, sulfur dioxide meets water. So you can imagine sulfur dioxide as a molecule; it's be it's being um, it's been produced in the in the combustion process, um, but it meets a water drop. Well, there's lots of water there, so it instantly reacts and it forms sulfurous acid. Uh, if it's sulfur trioxide, you will get sulfuric acid, but the the end result is not that much different in the sense that they're both acids. And these can cause uh, their strong acids, which can cause considerable damage to um, to 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 living organisms uh, around them. Uh, so, just to give you, uh, there's a lot of detail on here, but it just gives you a, a sort of an idea as to what sort of effects you can have. Um, you've got uh, different types of things which are producing. Uh, sulfur oxides and nitrogen oxides and these are molecules uh, which are being absorbed maybe into into water droplets and so they're being they're easy to spread and that's the thing here that this can be spread very very quickly uh, and so one of the examples of um, uh, one of the examples of when volcanoes erupt, the fact that you, the, the dust clouds and the aerosols which are formed can travel long distances in relatively short spaces of time and have effects a long, in, a long way away from the, the, original, uh, um, the original source of the, of the, uh, of the, of the pollution. Uh, this is this is an example of uh, this type of uh, this type of thing. Oops! Now it seems to have gone to sleep. Oh. Uh, okay, here it is. No, it's just it's just decided to go to sleep for two seconds. Okay. So, what sort of effects? Well, okay. So you've got the you've got these things dissolving in in the, the the water droplets. So you get clouds of sulfuric acid, clouds of nitric acid, clouds of uh, sulfurous acid, um, and this could be rain or it could be snow. Acid snow doesn't sound so great. Um, of course, it kills trees. Uh, we remember the uh, the photographs when this was this first became 
let's say, recognized uh, as a problem in the 70s and the 80s, although it had been around for a long, long time previously, uh, particularly in Northern Europe, I think, uh, it seems to recall Sweden and Norway uh, were concerned about their, the, the forests. But of course, metal bridges, things which are made of metal or things which are made of um, marble, erosion of, uh, of statues and stuff, and of course, uh, this gets into the water and it uh, accumulates in um, it accumulates in the uh, in water courses like ponds and lakes and you get acidification which of course uh, just basically um, damages uh, damages aquatic life okay so this is just a, a sort of a general scheme. So obviously this is not a not a great thing. Um, so if we think about uh, think about so we've talked about visible and invisible. Visible is like particulate matter which you can actually see. Um, invisible is chemical. So it's really at the level of the gases. Um, we can also sort of divide things into um, other categories such as uh, man-made natural um, and looking at the man-made sources uh, we've got things which are outside and things which are inside so looking at the outdoor um, the obvious ones are vehicle emissions uh, home heating so if you're burning fuel oils natural gas okay so when you switch your heating on because it gets getting a little bit chilly um, of course, uh, air pollution is also caused as a byproduct of manufacturing uh, and power generation. I'm thinking here that there is um, uh, there's a along the motorway going towards uh, mo towards Milan from Verona. At a certain point, I think it's near Brescia. There is a um, uh, there's a steel a steel mill, so it's a factory making steel. And um, I think they've had to uh, they had to clarify. <laughs> Oops! It seems to have decided to go to sleep again. Um, they've had to clarify what is coming out of the chimney because um, they have a sign on the on the factory wall which says uh, "vapore aquio," which means water vapor. Okay, uh, because it it produces a lot of steam and particularly in the winter when the air is cold you get a lot of condensation so you see the cloud of steam more uh, more clearly but of course what this means is that you have um, you have industrial processes which are uh, producing um, uh, producing uh, gas as a side products um, but you also have smoke which is coming from uh, combustion. Um, methane is produced in landfills okay uh, it's also produced by cows there's a lot of uh, um, a lot of let's say um, pollution is associated with agriculture uh, now we typically I think we typically think of pollution associated with agriculture is to do with fertilizers. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but there is also a certain amount associated with um, with methane and ammonia, which is um, uh, associated with the uh, uh, some with the uh, with the fertilizers, but also with bacteria which are breaking down. Um, the, uh, the the waste from uh, from uh, animal uh, animal feed, for example, animal uh, produce. Um, so let's just see if this, okay. So okay, we're still on the out outdoors now. I've mentioned some of these uh, mentioned some of these uh, molecules, CO2, nitrogen oxides, but there are some others here which are maybe not so uh, not so familiar. The, Polycyclic aromatics. Now, this is this is pretty hardcore organic chemistry. However, the PAHs are extremely important because uh, they are extremely carcinogenic, and they sometimes occur because of incorrect combustion or incomplete combustion, and they can be associated with uh, fine particulate matter. Um, 
I have to say, I don't want this to be like a scary story in the sense. It just this is just a description of how of of what things are like. Okay, so please don't. Uh, you know, um, unfortunately, we have lots of these things in in the world, um, and I suppose what we need to be thinking of is how we can uh, how we can move away from this. But <coughs> these things are there. However, um, many people don't consider sources of pollution indoors. Um, for some reason it's like the world stops at the door and what's inside your house is a different world. Well it's not. Um, and this, I tell you, this may look romantic but it's actually <laughs> It's actually it's actually pretty deadly um, in the sense that um, what you're doing is you're burning um, you're burning in this case it's wood but it could be coal it could be low grade coal it could be lignite it could be dung um, in particular you're not it looks romantic but it's not very efficient and so the the combustion process is actually pretty poor. Um, what does this mean? Uh, this means that if you aren't burning things properly, you will produce carbon monoxide, which could kill you. Um, you'd be producing uh, all sorts of particulate matter, uh, in and you will have things like the polyaromatics, uh, and these are part of uh, part of the products which come from incomplete uh, combustion of uh, organic materials. And by organic materials, I mean uh, things like wood or tobacco. Okay, so if anybody smokes, um, this is something to be thinking about. Um, and of course, we also have the volatile organics. Now you're thinking, oh, what are volatile organics? Well, um, if you think about it, um, if you've ever been in a situation of uh, being near a wood burning stove, it has a particular odor, it has a particular smell, and this is the this is the volatile these are the volatile molecules which are um, let's say interacting with your nose uh, and which are telling you that this is <laughs> this is a, a wood stove, but they are they are molecules which have their 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 activities. Okay, so. Um, even something like this, which is fine if you go camping for a couple of nights a year, I think. Um, but these are producing, uh, this type of lamp produces lots of fine particles and it has a very inefficient, uh, very inefficient combustion. Now, I've just realized that I've been talking about inefficient combustion. What does this mean? It means that when I take a fuel, I mix it with oxygen and some heat in order to burn it. The idea is that all of the carbon atoms in the fuel will be converted to carbon dioxide and all of the hydrogen atoms will be converted to water. Okay, That's the full chemical reaction. But if the conditions are such that the temperature is not high enough it doesn't go to completion in the sense that you have things which are half burned, half oxidized, and so you get a bit of a mix, and that's where the danger that's where the danger comes in. Um, this is uh, this is a pretty scary uh, pretty scary statistic. Now, of course, this will refer to countries where um, you don't necessarily get your energy by switching on an induction hob or uh, lighting the gas, okay, um, typically low and middle income countries, but 3.8 million premature deaths caused by long term exposure to the particles and the products which are produced by um, inefficient, uh, inefficient burning, okay. Other indoor pollutants which are uh, definitely relevant to um, definitely relevant to houses in Europe now. Um, so we spent a lot of our time inside, particularly in the winter, uh, and some of us smoke. Uh, most of us clean. Uh, sometimes we paint. 
sometimes we have new furniture um, almost always there's dust around from somewhere and sometimes we may have well actually we, we all have um, to a greater or lesser extent exposure to biological pollutants so for example mold dust mites now dust mites these are horrible things best not to think about them um, but they're all over um, your mattress is probably full of them. <laughs> okay, so uh, it's just part of it's part of the part of being an animal on the surface of the earth. Okay, but what's the point here? The point here is that even in the house, we are exposed to lots and lots of air pollutants. Just thinking in our house, um, in particular, um, over the last few years, um, we've had to we've had to change our uh, cleaning solutions uh, to look for uh, particular products which don't have particular components, because at a certain point, my uh, my better my better half uh, started to uh, sneeze for no apparent reason, and it we gradually worked out that uh, she has. She has quite a severe allergy to cleaning to so some some components in some cleaning products. So, again, volatile organic uh, uh, chemicals, which are uh, acting as pollutants. Okay. Um, so I've mentioned things like paints. Paints are uh, a, a good example, particularly the um, the solvent-based paints. Um, glue, of course. Well, this was a <laughs> so this is a classic for uh, growing up in the in the 1970s for the punk rockers. Uh, glue was obviously a great source of uh, of entertainment. Um, but you may have things like um, those candles which you light to make your uh, your place uh, smell smell nice and what have you. You are releasing extra things into the uh, into the atmosphere so these are all potential sources of volatile organic compounds um, nails uh, so some of the common ones that you may come across are acetone uh, even the substitutes the acetone substitutes they're not um, they're not uh, totally innocent in the sense that acetone is what it is, but even its substitutes, you can smell them, which means they're volatile. Okay, uh, benzene. This is a bad one, uh, but it's not so. It's not so common. It's. it's this is incomplete combustion. Butanol from candles. Uh, you may have mothballs. Once upon a time, this was naphthalene. Um, okay. Now it's just. I'm looking at the chat. I don't. Uh, yeah, I usually say uh, with vinegar and baking soda. Yeah, I mean I, that's what we've sort of moved over to. Uh, so I put me three there, me two, me three. Um, I, ethanol. Uh, now ethanol is a funny one because uh, it's okay in wine, beer, grappa, but um, it also comes up in in glass cleaners. Formaldehyde is a bad one. Uh, typically produced. Um, it's typically produced. It's typically released over time from certain types of polymers, certain types of plastic materials. Okay, uh, and in particular, the types of materials which are used for um, furniture and that type of uh, either coverings or structures. Um, and terpenes. Now, terpenes is just a, a clack. <laughs> Is a is a it's a class of compounds which uh, I could talk to, talk to you about these for ages and ages and ages because they they it's a very important class of compounds. Um, but as it says here, typically associated with fragrances. But just to give you an example, um, lemons smell of lemons smell of lemons because they have limonene. Limonene is a terpene. Uh, so. The types of molecules which are associated with um, with fragrances and with cooking 
are uh, quite often uh, terpenes. Okay, these are the polyaromatic hydrocarbons. Uh, they are uh, associated with uh, burning things like tobacco and burning things like uh, cellulose products. Well, of course, tobacco is a cellulose product. Um, they are extremely persistent. In other words, they hang around for a long, long time. Um, and they may be found in particulate matter. So, for example, the, uh, uh, the rubber from the road that type of uh, that type of uh, um, <clears throat> that type of material can contain uh, these molecules. These are uh, associated with um, carcinogenicity, so they are pretty. Uh, this this is this is bad stuff. Okay, so I'm now going to sort of switch from the air and I'm going to go to um going to go to the, look at some water uh something about water pollution um i don't know whether anyone has any comments or any questions before i change okay let's decided to okay anybody got any any comments or questions Okay, I'll tell you. What, I'll, I'll I'll carry I'll carry on, and you guys can can uh, put. Yeah. Uh, For the moment, it's only in the chat. Because okay, um, okay, that, that, <laughs> no, no, that's that's fine, that's fine. Okay, fine. so water pollution. Okay, so this is exactly the equivalent of air pollution. So you're talking about putting things into water into a water course, uh, which shouldn't really be there. Okay, so it could be groundwater below the surface, so it could be an aquifer. Uh, there are many, many examples of um, pollution of aquifers. It could be um, a water, what's called a water course, which is uh, something like a lake, a stream, a river, an estuary. Uh, it obviously it could be the sea, the oceans. Um, and what tends, what happens is we completely alter the natural composition of the water, and that upsets the balance in the ecosystems. Um, because one of the big differences between air and water, of course, is that um, uh, there are a whole set of ecosystems which are uh, based on uh, on water. So. Um goes without saying that uh, all life on Earth uh, needs water in some form. Um, we actually, as people, we actually need quite a lot of water, so water is actually very important for us. Uh, and the, let's say that having access to clean water is one of the key uh, aspects of development projects in uh, in developing countries because many many people we t we may take it for granted but many many people don't have uh, have access to um, uh, to, to to clean water for drinking or for their daily activities and of course um, Quite often, we've seen so many, so many photographs of this, uh, of watercourses, rivers, and lakes and streams being used as um, as rubbish dumps, and also uh, the sea, of course. So uh, we talk about the, um, the plastic, uh, the plastic uh, garbage uh, island in the Pacific, and so we have. I think we have a, a good idea as to. Um, let's say the consequences of, uh, of macro pollution of, uh, of, of water courses. But let's just think for a minute how we actually use water in the house or how we actually use water uh, in, um, in, in everyday life. So um, water itself is a liquid. 
that's a bit obvious. Um, it's actually a very interesting liquid. It's a very, it has a, a, some very unusual properties. Uh, um, the fact that it freezes at, 100 de at zero degrees and boils at 100 degrees, um, which is a nice range. Uh, the fact that it's liquid at 20 degrees, 30 degrees is fine. It's good for us because it's good for uh, it's good for us as organisms. Um, it has a particular set of properties, physical properties, physical chemical properties, which make it an excellent solvent. Um, it's also a reagent. In other words, it, it's reactive. We don't tend to think of it as being reactive in everyday uh, everyday life, but uh, it is. Uh, all you have to do if you don't if you if you want a classic example put your bicycle outside under the rain and leave it there for six months and then go back and have a look at it okay um so it's often used for cleaning uh it's obviously used for cleaning in the house it's also used for cleaning in uh, in industry um so i've got an example there which is um leather production um and leather production has a bit of a bad reputation, let's say, uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, but water is absolutely fundamental to the chemical processing to make leather. So every time you buy a leather bag or a leather belt, um, there is uh, a certain amount of water has been used to allow you to get to that product. Another example would be cotton. Cotton is a similar uh, similar thing. We tend to think of, yeah, cotton, nice natural product or nice natural material. Um, from the water point of view, it's actually very expensive in, in the sense you need a lot of water to, uh, to produce cotton. And sometimes cotton is grown in places which don't actually have a lot of water, which is a bit of a paradox. Um, okay, so we're using water to uh, to clean stuff. Uh, we've got some washing machines here. This is not the type of washing machine you have in your house. But of course, you put soaps in your washing machines and you use, you may use softeners, you may use a whole range of products to um, uh, to help you uh, clean your uh, clean your clothes, but also keep the machine the the water the washing machine uh, healthy. Let's say, just thinking where we are uh, in northern in Verona in northern Italy, the water is quite is quite hard. So uh, that means that uh, there's a lot of calcium in it. And that means that this can really cause a lot of problems for washing machines. So what you do is you add water softeners, okay? But of course the water softeners, well, they leave the washing machine at the end of the wash. Uh, they do a bit of uh, chemistry with the calcium, but there's still excess phosphate going into the into the drains. So we are contaminant we're cleaning our clothes but contaminating the the uh, the water with other components okay i'm not advocating not washing your clothes it's just i'm sort of raising a little bit of awareness here um, but even then i have to say that we've sort of had a, a think about this and you know you, you look for alternatives and well uh, there's, it's not so easy to get the information that you might want in order to make the choices. Okay, so um, thinking about household waste, and this is in general, so we have washing waste, but of course we have also have bathroom waste, which is maybe not quite so nice to talk about, um, but we have uh, chemical stuff, but we also have... Um, things which are more biological, so we may have uh, pathogenic uh, bacteria. Um, and if you think about a city, you will have uh, production processes, you'll have uh, productive industries, you'll have people making stuff and producing waste. Um, and quite often there will be sediment or there will be sludge, which is sort of uh, like mud, if you like, but it's contaminated. And so this will all end up in the in the wastewater, and this will have to be managed somehow. Um, so 
you can uh, you can imagine that uh, waste treatment can become quite uh, can become quite difficult actually. Um, so water pollution, just as air pollution, can also occur naturally. Um, so we do get uh, algal blooms and um, what typically volcanoes. These are the bad guys, <laughs> um, spectacular but bad. Uh, and you know they they can affect the acidity of uh, of watercourses with uh, uh, fallout from uh, from eruption. Uh, but then of course we also have um, more. Uh, macro type of materials such as the micropla microplastics. Um, inter it's interesting that it's the microplastics which are becoming uh, more and more, uh, let's say, to the fore in the consciousness of people who are uh, sort of uh, every day. A few years ago, no one even taught, no one even mentioned them. Uh, but now people are much more aware, and I think we'll see over the next few years that there will be more and more uh, awareness and more and more done about this because in part every time we do washing cycles with our pile jumpers we are contributing to the uh, to the microplastic uh, the microplastic problem so this is something which uh, we will see uh, become more and more important. Okay, so um, domestic waste, domestic sewage, um, is uh, is organic, and as organic, it's a substrate for bacteria, uh, and some of these bacteria are actually pathogenic, and this is where we get. Uh, public health problems where uh, sewage is not treated and directly pumped into the sea and so uh, people will suffer from uh, um, gastroenteritis or what have you as they uh, take in some of these uh, these pathogens so the whole idea of these this processing is that um, we're reducing the levels of the, uh, of the, of the pathogens. Um, but I just want to s sort of put an idea in your mind for a minute, which is um, the amount of waste which is produced by a city. So if you take a, um, take a big city, um, there's a lot of waste being produced and there's a lot of uh, solid waste but also a lot of uh, liquid waste, a lot of waste going into the into the sewage uh, system. And so for example, one of the, uh, I haven't seen this in Italy yet but uh, a, few, a few months ago, uh, one of the things which uh, is happening in the UK is um, they're having problems in some cities with um, the sewerage or the sewage tubes becoming blocked, uh, and the, they, these things are these tubes are blocking uh, because of the presence of what they call fatbergs. And what this is, it's people pouring um, pouring oils and fats down the down the sink. And these thing, these uh, these oils, uh, they congeal, they solidify in the sewers. But together with lots and lots of other things, uh, the these uh, let's say these uh, mixtures or agglomerates of things, uh, materials actually block the sewers and just a few months ago uh, I think it's one of the cities in the south of uh, south of England I think it may have been Southampton um, they actually extracted one of these agglomerates which was about one ton a thousand kilos okay at least yeah uh, and this is this sort of gives you an idea of, well it's a sort of a medium sized city but a medium sized city is still a lot of people and so the I think the guy you know, the, 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 the plants that work with sewage they have their work definitely uh, cut out to um, uh, 
uh, to deal with this. Okay, so um, okay, so let me just uh, let me just move on to one of the classic uh, one of the classic examples of problems with um, th with inappropriate. <coughs> Uh, inappropriate management of uh, domestic sewage is um, eutrophication. Uh, eutrophication is something which uh, happens, it actually happens naturally, but in the natural cycle it's actually a very slow process. Um, and it's interesting because uh, again we have this idea of um, life cycles for people and animals, but even water courses like a pond or a river or a lake has a life cycle. And eutrophication typically happens towards the end of the uh, the, the life cycle of a, of a water course. Um, basically, what happens is that the algae in the uh, in the water, um, they they use they use up the oxygen in the water, and once they use up the oxygen, it's not available for fish. It's not available for other organisms, um, and once they die, once they die, they go to the they they sink to the bottom of the lake or the the bottom of the watercourse. Um, and at that point, they are decomposed by bacteria which don't need oxygen by the anaerobes, where there's little or no oxygen. Okay, and at that point, um, what you have is basically you have a system which removes the oxygen from the from the water. Now, this process is is acceler accelerated when uh, water contains nitrates and phosphates because these are typical fertilizers okay um, and so when you have excess nitrate and phosphate this will cause w what's called an algal bloom um, there's an example in the background of this photograph basically the algae which are the which are sort of small uh, single-celled uh, plants basically um, they start having a party because uh, there's just loads of there's loads of oxygen, there's loads of nitrates, loads of phosphates, and there's loads of sunlight. But of course, no party can last last forever, and eventually, uh, let's say the uh, someone has to pay the piper, and so um, you end up basically killing the uh, you, you kill the the the, the life. Uh, the capacity of this water course to uh, to to support life, um, particularly as the anaerobes they start releasing hydrogen sulfide, which is extremely toxic, um, and which is also extremely uh, it's toxic to us, but it's also toxic to other organisms which uh, use oxygen. So, in other words, basically the whole thing just goes out of hand and it uh, it dies. Okay, so eutrophication is a very, um, uh, it's a well-known, well-described process, but it can be accelerated by excess, um, uh, excess phosphates, nitrates from um, either from domestic um, domestic use or also obviously from agricultural use. It's a, so typically associated with the agricultural runoff, which is the water which comes off the fields. Okay, um, so we've sort of talked about sort of some stuff that you find in the house. Um, this is the sort of stuff that you won't find in the house, but you will typically find in an environment which is associated with um, industries or industrial exploitation of some description. Um, and yeah, this is where it does get a little bit dark, to be honest with you. As I was putting this together, I was thinking, yeah, um, but if we're talking about pollution, um, it's going to be a, a pretty, let's say, a pretty sad story. Um, so when we think about um, extractive industries, so mining, uh, mines in particular, um, 
copper mines, gold mines. Uh, these are extremely polluting uh, activities um, because of the way the, uh, the metals, which are economically valuable, are extracted from the, uh, from the rock or from the matrix. Um, so this, this type of uh, toxic, water, tox, toxic water waste um, is typically poisonous. It could be radioactive because sometimes you have, um, the, for example, the, uh, the settling ponds in um, nuclear reactors where you have um, the water, you have the, let's say, water which is radioactive or contains radioactive uh, components which is uh, allowed to evaporate in order to solidify the uh, the components. Um, explosive <laughs> That could that could be a problem if you are if you're uh, evaporating uh, water from uh, certain um, deposits of ammonium nitrate and stuff. Um, carcinogenic, of course, this is cancer causing. Mutagenic, uh, quite often related to these these the, these things are related. Uh, teratogenic. Uh, and we're going to see some examples uh, of this in a little while. And then we have um, the idea of uh, waste, which is bioaccumulative. Now, that may sound a little bit fancy, but what this means is that um, it's these are components, these are pollutants, which are able to... Um, they become concentrated as you get into higher levels of the food chain. So if you remember, talk, we talked about food chains uh, a while ago. Um, you have the primary, uh, the primary consumers, and then you have the primary, uh, primary producers and primary consumers. And then you have a whole set of people other things feeding off uh, of these uh, the people at the, let's say the animals or the plants at the bottom um, and so what happens here is the because of the nature of the uh, food chain uh, these um, these toxic substances can actually accumulate okay so um, I've mentioned uh, extractive industries and obviously chemical plant uh, chemical plants, particularly in the past. Um, I'm also thinking about uh, industrial industrial plants such as um, I mentioned leather making. Uh, leather making historically was uh, an activity which is uh, which has been considered extremely polluting and typically was banished to the outskirts of uh, outskirts of towns. Uh, it's not the only one. Uh, there are many, many others, um, including production of polyfluorinated compounds and uh, lots of different, let's say, uh, different molecules, different chemicals which are used uh, industrially. Okay. Um, and as I mentioned before, also extractive industries. So, for example, um, these three uh, these three metals here, which are sort of quite famous for being uh, not very pleasant, um, lead, mercury, and chromium. Um, lead was typically uh, was typically mined for its uh, its for for use in. Uh, tubing. The Romans used it for in tubing, for example, uh, but also for uh, making joints between things. Um, in fact, uh, in the uh, during the 1500s, the dissolution of the monasteries, the um, uh, one of the things which Henry VIII, this was in uh, in, in, in England, uh, one of the things which Henry VIII uh, insisted upon was getting the lead from the roofs of the of the monasteries because there was a lot of lead there. Um, mercury, quite often a side product of um, lead mining and uh, zinc mining, uh, zinc a metal which is obviously useful in its own right. Um, chromium. 
uh, again, it's one of those compounds, one of those metals which you which we've met which you will have seen you have it in your house probably um, it's also used uh, in in steel making to make stronger steel okay um, you also have things like surface runoff now pesticides so it's not just pesticides that farmers are using but it's also pesticides that we may use to control things in our gardens so uh, lots of different, let's say, places where this directions where this waste can come from. Um, we also should think about sediment, for example. This is a, a river with a lot of sediment in it. Um, it's naturally part of the, let's say, the erosion rock forming cycle. Okay. Oops. It's decided to go to sleep. Maybe. Just two seconds. It's. Um, Echo. There we go. Right. So um, this, so some some rivers are naturally full of sediment. Um, others become full of sediment at certain points uh, in the, in the year or when it rains too hard. Um, sediment is obviously coming from um, runoff. Uh, which is bringing mud or whatever from the uh, the surrounding fields or the surrounding uh, riverbanks, the surrounding land into the uh, river itself. Um, but of course, if the river is normally uh, normally clear, uh, sediment has big causes problems because uh, it upsets the ecology of the uh, uh, of the ecosystem in the river. If, uh, if normally it's clear and so you want to have plants which is photosynthesizing and what have you. So um, this can also in, uh, it can also disrupt um, reproduction in fish. It can smother uh, organisms on the bottom. And so it can be, this can be a bit, bit of a problem. And in particular where you have deforestation happening, um, this is associated with uh, looser soil, looser surface soil, which is associated with increased sediment in the in the runoff when the uh, when when it rains uh, when it rains a lot. So you can see how even something like a, thinking about a forest changing the um, changing the makeup of a forest will can have an effect on uh, these other things which are uh, associated with water okay so um, oil pollution um, this is something which I think we all have we've all seen I think there were some examples there was an example a few months ago of uh, Madagascar um, and well, accidental. Uh, there's accidental oil spills where ships break sometimes. Uh, sometimes there is deliberate oil spilling where ships clean their oil tanks, and this is something which is uh, they tend to do out of the way of, uh, of probing eyes, let's say. Um, the problem is the oil is lighter than, as well, some of the oil is lighter than water. Some of this, uh, some of the uh, oil, is is heavier. The, the heavy crude will sink to the bottom, and it will smother the uh, uh, it will smother the, um, uh, the the life which is living on the on the bottom of the sea. So uh, the other thing that we maybe forget is that uh, roads, cars, uh, where you have cars, you have oil. And so there is ro there is a sort of like a low level but a constant level of uh, runoff uh, of uh, oil. Now, just to give you some examples, uh, some of these uh, some of you may uh, you may remember if you're a little bit older like me. Uh, I remember this one, the Amoco Cadiz. Um, now I've converted these into liters the original data was in uh, in barrels which is it makes no uh, it makes no sense but the numbers are so huge I cannot imagine what 262 million liters actually looks like um, 
I could convert it into swimming pools, but I think I'd still have a stupidly big number. So um, I remember this one, this is 78, this is the Brittany coast. Um, Exxon Valdez, uh, this was in Alaska. This was also uh, a big one, 89, 40, 42 million uh, liters. This one, uh, I'd never heard of. Uh, these are um, associated with the sea. Uh, so the first two and the last one are associated with the sea. This is actually the biggest oil spill on land that there's ever been. Um, it was a, uh, a, a series of pipes, a series of oil pipes broke because basically they corroded. Uh, and spill, they spilled around about 334 million litres of crude. Okay. Um, but the worst one is this one, the Deepwater Horizon. Um, over 500 million litres of oil. Okay, and this is 2010. I think we remember this. So it's clear that uh, you know, there are some really sort of, let's say, uh, historically bad examples. And of course, cleaning this stuff up is, uh, is difficult and it takes a long time. Now, as I was looking at that, I was thinking, oh, well, so, so how many oil spills are there every year? Because you can get pretty depressed about this. Um, and this is a data from a, an organization which actually tracks, uh, it's an environmental organization which actually tracks the, uh, the, the number of spills um, over a period. But what, they, what their data shows uh, and this is a decade average, is that there is a uh, there is a reduction. So I suppose that's positive, given that there is actually more oil being moved around, okay, because we're still producing uh, more oil, um, which is not a good thing. But at least people are being a little bit more careful with it, okay. Uh, part of that is almost certainly linked to the fact that there is more, let's say, legal recourse to getting people, to getting companies to actually pay for uh, sorting out the mess. But, okay, so this is a, just a, uh, let's say, a, 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 an interesting, um, um, uh, an interesting uh, sort of graph to show how things are, are, are moving. Okay, uh, so what's just written? The Prestige in Spain. Yes, I remember that. That also uh, Galicia. Okay, right. Okay, so any um, uh, the no prizes, but anybody recognise this? Has anyone ever been here? I'm waiting for an answer in the chat. <laughs> anybody recognise it? No, it's Brussels. Yes, it is. That's right. It's the ato do you remember, do you, it's the atomium. Yes, it is the atomium. Yes. Now I tell you, when I went when I went there, and this was back in well in the Jurassic times, um, it wasn't this clean. <laughs> it's been it's been polished, <laughs> and. Um, but it's still a pretty, it's still a pretty unusual, uh, unusual thing. And but of course, uh, I think this is this is actually the right photo here because the, this whole thing is about um, how uh, a lot of this pollution stuff is connected to um, the idea of making a better world. Now, of course, it's also about making lots of money because it's always associated with the economy. But uh, the symbol was uh, this, um, let's say, this growth after the Second World War. The world was, or certainly Europe, had been devastated. And so there was this desire to move forward to a brighter future. And um, and in particular, say, the science uh, and chemistry in particular, maybe not overtly, obviously, but it was there and it was uh, doing its, 
doing its stuff. Um, science was being seen as, or was seen as being at the service of society. So uh, the sorts of, let's say, um, uh, the sorts of thinking which were being used uh, around the atomic, uh, the atomic world, the, the atomic physics, which was to bring uh, free or cheap energy to to, to people, um, uh, was part of this, let's say, vision of a of, of, a, of a better a better future. Of course, the other side of that, of course, was um, nuclear proliferation, but that's something that we don't we don't need to talk about here. Um, but thinking about uh, thinking about this, we have um, this idea of being able to make materials, being able to make things which are uh, are in improvement, which have better properties, better qualities, and which make our lives easier. Uh, uh, which make our lives better, uh, more, for, more, um, uh, let's say, improve, just basically improve our our, our condition. Um, but this is where I have to introduce these guys, the persistent organic pollutants, um, and this, the the pops are intimately linked with this idea of uh, industrial and economic development. Okay, now it says. That I am going to pre press any button. Okay, there we go. Okay, um, so uh, a huge, a huge desire for new products, uh, new materials, plastics, textiles, medicines, herbicides, insecticides. So, just to take the simple example of the medicines, for example. Um, most of the medicines, if not all of the medicines that we use today. Uh, were discovered after the Second World War, uh, starting with uh, the development of penicillin as an antibiotic, but most of the others uh, were, have been discovered in the years since then. Um, the idea of textiles, materials which have um, excellent physical properties uh, for wearing, but which are um, which can be made on huge scale in nice colours and what have you. These are also uh, things which were um, which became more prominent after uh, the Second World War, and of course herbicides, insecticides, because part of the development was the agricultural, the green revolution, which was about making agriculture more. Uh, which is about making agriculture more productive, okay? Because you have uh, ex expansion of cities, more people, and so um, the idea was that uh, this could be done through technology, okay? And chemistry, in particular, was uh, was behind a lot of this, uh, a lot of the, these new things. Now, the thing is that people, I think. We tend to we tend to judge by our own let's say uh, our own standards, but this isn't to let these guys off the hook. Um, but it's it also is part of this this thing which uh, objectively many of these products, many of these new products, were actually useful at the time. Uh, but the bit that was missing was this: the consequence of uh, of making these uh, in terms of effects on the environment, uh, effects on sustainability. And there, it's clear that in this period there are many, many, many examples, and we'll see some um, many examples of uh, basically uh, the economics and profit. Uh, taking over from um, uh, any, let's say, uh, any considerations about the uh, environmental effects. So um, we need uh, there's a need for more people, more people making more things, 
uh, and in particular synthetic products. I'm just going to move on to these guys. So I've introduced the idea of the pers persistent organic pollutants. Um, this is a group of chemicals. It's quite a diverse group. They're not. Some of them are related to each other. Um, some of them uh, are not. Um, but we have things like um, aldrin and DDT, which are insecticides. DDT you've probably heard of. Aldrin maybe not, apart from maybe Buzz Aldrin, but that's that's a person. Um, we've got the PCBs, the polychlor polychlorinated biphenyls. You may have heard of them, maybe not. This is very much industrial uh, industrial stuff. Uh, the, the the dioxins. You may have heard of dioxins. Unlikely that you've heard of the dibenzofurans. It doesn't matter about the names of these things because um, the point is that these are molecules which at the time seemed like a good idea. But then as we started to understand more and more, um, they were re-evaluated. Okay. So, What's the deal with the POPs? Well, the thing with the POPs is that they are extremely resistant to metabolism. Uh, what that means is that they're basically not broken down. So they're ingested and they stay there. Um, however, as they get into higher organisms, uh, and in particular as they get into people, those uh, those compounds are present in concentrations which are high enough for them to start to have physiological effects, and that's the that that's the that's the problem. So, um, what happens is these these things hang around. That's why they're called persistent, and they accumulate. So as they go up the the food chain, um, you have this process of what's called biomagnification. Um, and so the molecules are concentrating in the in the higher organisms. Now, of course, we don't eat orca, but we certainly eat salmon and we certainly eat herring. Okay, so you can see how uh, how this thing could uh, or can uh, uh, can affect us. Okay, so. Let's let's give let, let's give some time, a few minutes, to uh, a couple of examples here. So DDT. Now this this is a real this is a real advert. It's a real let's say publicity thing. If you go on you if you go on Google and Google DDT um, adverts advertisements, uh, you'll see some really 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 scary stuff. Uh, this was actually a song. There was a song. People sang this. DDT is good for me. Um, there was a ditty. Uh, it was part of a publicity campaign. Now, um, uh, DDT was introduced for uh, pest control. So it was used extremely widely. And it started off, um, it was used agriculturally, but it was also used around the house. Um, this is not an unusual situation. A lady, as part of the things that you would have in the cupboard under the sink, you have a DDT sprayer, okay, uh, for control of household pests. So this is obviously stuff like uh, cockroaches and things, okay. Um, it is cheap to make. It's extremely effective, and it's been estimated that now this is this is a lot. Two million metric tons. Okay, so if you want, that's uh, two billion kilos. I've got no idea how big that is, um, but considering that you use it at concentrations which are not particularly high, um, that's a lot of stuff. Okay, and it was used from uh, well, basically spraying on crops to uh, protecting soldiers from uh, insect-borne diseases such as malaria and typhus during World War II and then afterwards. Um, but then around about 62, 1962, uh, this lady's famous lady, um, Rachel Carson, uh, started to um, 
uh, well, she, she published a book called Silent Spring, and this refers to um, the fact that it was becoming increasingly evident that the levels of DT, DDT in the environment were having an effect on birds. And in particular, they were having a, an effect on the eggshells of birds. And since the birds in particular that she was, uh, that seemed to be affected were the falcons uh, and the eagles. So they were the predators. So they are, if we go back to our uh, our food chain, they are the apex, they are the top of the... Pre so these animals or these birds were accumulating DDT. And what was found, this is a peregrine falcon, uh, what was found is that the DDT accumulated in the eggshells and or there was an, a metabolite of DDT which was accumulating in the eggshells and this caused the eggshells to get thinner and thinner and thinner um, such that when the adults actually sat on the eggs, the eggs would break. Okay, so they couldn't actually uh, bring the eggs to, uh, to term. Uh, and this was now. This is a it's a very interesting, let's say, scientific investigation because um, the scientists were able to study the eggs from the birds in the field, but they were also able to confirm eggs from confirm the data from eggs which had been collected before DDT was used. So in museum collections. Okay, and uh, so there was a huge amount of uh, field data and laboratory data for this, and the evidence was overwhelming that um, DDT was having this really uh, terrible effect on uh, on uh, the apex predators because of the accumulation. Um, at least one species of falcon in the U.S. Uh, it's called the duck hawk because it used to eat mostly ducks. Uh, was driven to extinction. Um, things got, let's say, uh, particularly, let's say, um, uh, people got particularly interested because of this guy is a bald eagle, and the bald eagle in the U.S. and Canada is it. These are iconic birds, and so uh, people were um, were worried when they saw that uh, the bald eagle populations were also affected because, again, it's also an apex predator. Um, so, what happened with DDT? Well, it's not quite so clear cut because um, DDT is extremely effective for controlling mosquito populations. Um, and so it, there's a balance here. We have to be, we have to be very careful about, um, uh, let's say, damming it completely. Um, it is still used in particular controlled conditions for uh, public health campaigns for the eradication of um, malaria carrying mosquitoes. Yeah, exactly. So uh, it's, it's something which we wouldn't use here, uh, probably wouldn't, get, wouldn't be allowed in Europe, but um, it's, it's, it's one of those examples of, let's say, the balance between things. Um, okay, I'm just going to go for a couple of more minutes and then I'm going to leave a little bit of time for any comments or any questions. So, um, the polychlorinated biphenyls, PCBs for short, um, this is a, a class of compound which you may almost certainly you've never heard of, uh, but they are very important because they are present in many, many old uh, pieces of electric equipment or industrial equipment. Um, so uh, large scale transformers and stuff like this. And there are many, many examples where these things have to be dismantled from factories, old factories and what have you. Um, and many of these, uh, many of these old uh, pieces of um, uh, industrial equipment um, 
are full of uh, these materials here because they were excellent ins ins electrical insulators. Um, but it's been shown that they have um, really quite devastating impacts on different types of uh, organisms. So uh, typical uh, mammals, reproductive effects, birds, eggshell thinning, uh, reptiles decline. It's probably related to eggshell thinning. Um, fish, reproductive problems, and snails, um, they actually, uh, snails change sex, so they, beco they, uh, they become mostly male rather than uh, a mix of male and female, but snails have a rather interesting uh, sex life anyway. So, um, okay, so again, it's the classic example of, this is the stuff you don't need to worry about the structures, but it's classic example of accumulation uh, and again we don't eat orcas but we do eat these guys and so these are um, uh, uh, accumulating typically in the fatty in the fatty tissues okay and I think I'll stop it I'll stop it there actually so um, all of this came together with a treaty, the Stockholm Treaty 2004, which was to, let's say, um, start to manage this problem of the, uh, of the persistent organic um, uh, persistent organic pollutants, because of course these things don't recognise uh, borders. Just to give you an example, this is dust now. This is dust which is spreading around the world. So it's quite clear that it's not a problem for one particular place. Uh, and this is true for many POPs that uh, they are, um, they may be produced in the locality, but that may, uh, they may, um, they may spread across, uh, across the, across the globe. Okay. So, uh, I'm going to I'm going to stop there. Uh, I hope that this has been sort of interesting. It's a bit sort of dark, I think, but uh, unfortunately, that's the nature of the it's the nature of the beast. Um, so I hope it's given you some some uh, some vocabulary, some things to oops, what's happened there, some things to think about. My screen, my screen has just died, so I don't know what's happening here. Uh, everything has frozen up. You can stop sharing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Your everything's blocked at the moment. So just two seconds. I think I've had a a CPU. It's just had a moment. Okay. Uh, right. Okay. I'm just going to stop sharing. Okay. Okay. And okay. I will uh, unmute our participants. So if you, if they want, they can ask questions. If anyone's got any questions or comments, yes, yeah. I think they can unmute now. Yeah. Okay. Okay, as usual, it's, uh, it's st stunned silence, but... Wait. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, sorry. My fault. Oops, and Gordon, you have to unmute. Uh, okay, right. That's okay, good. I think you can hear me now. Um, I think there are two ways of looking at this stuff. In that, because it is pretty dark. Uh, let's say um, you can either say, oh, "I don't want to know anything about it," <laughs> and and ignore it, or you have to maybe embrace it and just accept that it isn't good, but by knowing, by understanding something about it, by knowing something about it, 
um, you can you can maybe do something about it. That's the uh, I think that's the that's the thing. Um, I mean, I think the idea of, uh, for example, depending on which students you're working with. Um, there are maybe some, even some sort of uh, laboratory type activities that you can do with some of these things uh, in terms of uh, measuring uh, pollutants, measuring oxygen in water and this type of stuff. So uh, there are some activities that you could, uh, that you can do. I'll see if I can dig some out. Yeah, we have to start with ourselves and show an example for our students. Yes, exactly. 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 Okay. Anybody anybody else? It's uh, well, I think that time time is mm, uh, maybe a problem that, that people think that time can be a problem, so I have to go faster and faster, so i I choose um the products even for cleaning my house. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Because, for example, I do soap by myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I have to waste time to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's interesting because, um, okay, so like sort of coming back to the household cleaning things, uh, even a few years ago, uh, you know, it was, uh, we were using all sorts of different products and at a certain point um, uh, a guy who does um, who does tiles, ceramic tiles said oh you just wash them with uh, water and vinegar water with uh, aceto yeah and so it's like yeah okay well okay so your house smells a little bit like vinegar <laughs> for about three minutes but um, it's that it's that type of thing. You don't actually need many of a lot of these uh, a lot of these sophisticated uh, a lot of these sophisticated products. Um, and I think you're right. If you're making soap yourself, uh, you need to uh, you need to invest a little bit of uh, let's say patience in it. But once upon a time not so long ago making soap was part of the recycling in the house because you had oil which you needed to uh, recycle in some way um, and you would have um, uh, chenar, um, the remains of when you have a fire and so the, this was stuff which you would do uh, quite na which would be part of the household economy let's say so, ashes, maybe. yeah, ashes. That's it. Ashes. Yeah, I, I've forgotten how to speak English. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and yeah, this was this was all part of. Uh, it was all part of um, uh, many many things which you did yourself. You did yourself in the house. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Wait. Yeah, um, but again, I th I also think that there's an element of uh, okay, you can't make everything yourself. I mean, you, you're not going to make a washing machine. <laughs> well, you might, but it's going to be a bit difficult. Um, but in for many things, I think that having at least an idea of how you do this uh, gives you an appreciation of. Uh, sometimes the complexity of, of things um, and uh, it sort of uh, helps you sort of think about how you can maybe make a difference by maybe not 
buying the plastic bottle with the cor with the, the stuff in it because you don't you can make the stuff and you can put it in a bottle that you already have. Yeah. Uh, okay. You took the expression of brave new world. Yes. That. Well. Uh, the question why. Um, well, it's because that's exactly what Huxley talked about: the brave new world. Uh, the brave new world, not the new brave world. Brave new world, um, because he was talking about a society. This the whole the whole book is based on the contrast between natural man and modern man. Okay, and so it's this this idea of the the contrast between a primitive society, normal society, and this ultra let's say ultra modern. Uh, society in which uh, there was cloning and it was um, uh, you, they go to a tactile uh, cinema uh, they go to the feelies uh, rather than the talkies because you have to remember this was written in 1930s um, uh, and you have a whole set of things which is to do with this idea of modernity and so I think that it's a, a useful expression to talk about or to think about the historical period of expansion in all senses after the uh, after the 1940s, I think it's I think it's perfectly appropriate, um, and I think Huxley sort of used it um, in a sort of a sort of an iro I ironic way, the brave new world. But is it so? Is it so? Uh, is it so brave? <laughs> is it so new? Yeah. Okay. Right, I, I've I've talked enough for today, so I hope uh, I haven't ru ruined your evening. Um, so see you again in a few weeks' time, I think. Okay. Yeah. So it's going back in time. It's sort of the yes, from is going back in time. It's sort of going forward. Uh, yeah, I think I, I think I understand what you mean. Um, yeah, I think that we have to maybe take a step back in order to take a step forward. Yeah. Okay. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for your uh, your attention. It's uh, nice to nice to talk to you as usual. So. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And um, thank you all. Um, our next meeting is on the twentieth September. Mm -hmm. 4 or 30 p.m. from time. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Have a nice evening. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Bye. 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 <laughs> okay. So.